Hello, every folks, and good morning. Welcome to another edition of Know Your Unit. Today, we remember that I forgot about the Necromancer, so let's go ahead and talk about them real quick. So, like many endgame casters, the uh, the Necromancer is essentially a caster butt. Uh, there's always going to be a gimmick to a lot of these uh, later game casters, and that's, well, exactly their guy's deal. Uh, they're, like their name suggests, the Undead Specialist, uh, meaning that they're going to specialize in supporting them in one way or another. Now, this is also your kind of standard way to get a hold of, uh, of uh, phantom units, so like uh, ghosts and whatnot. Interestingly enough, uh, any kind of standard uh, zombie humanoids can be recruited with recruit, and also uh, any uh, um, like uh, dragons and things like that can be recruited with their relevant skill uh, uh, tame there, and you also have subdue for any of the beasts or anything like that. Basically, anything that isn't a skeleton or ghost uh, can already be recruited another way, just so you're aware. So you don't need these guys to get a hold of uh, um, of all undead, but just so you know, uh, they are going to be your main way of getting rid of those weird ones. So, uh, why would you use these guys? Well, a few factors are kind of interesting as far as the Necromancer goes. For one thing, uh, they've got pretty solid access if you are just looking for a standard uh, caster type of situation. Um, while they do have all of the basic spells, uh, like something like a wizard would have, they also have access to necromancy and most of the dark tree. Now, dark is, again, nothing particularly unusual. That's something the basic caster can do, but the necromancies have a lot of interesting abilities in there. You have Living Corpse, which allows you to revive a downed unit as a zombie. Um, bear in mind that this does not give them an instant turn, uh, so there is actually... I, I oftentimes see a little bit of a misconception as far as uh, folks uh, saying that, like, there's the endgame undead meta. Um, undead are good in two situations. For one thing, when you're really not focusing on speed, and for another thing, when there's nothing with exorcism. Otherwise, they have a lot of potential downtime during fights, including, you know, when you bring them back up. Uh, essentially, Living Corpse is one of the, one of the very few revives that still works uh, like it did back in PSP. But anyways, so this allows you to bring a unit back as an, as an undead. There's a lot of unit types that benefit from this. Uh, so, for example, if you're bringing back an octopus, they've got a lot of meat on them tentacles. And, uh, you know, oftentimes will benefit uh, from going and uh, just kind of slinking their way off to the back line, getting themselves knocked out. And as long as you're pressuring any uh, exorcism units on the team or making sure that they don't exist, essentially they can just come back and do all of their uh, crazy poison and breaching and whatever else moves with relative impunity. So there's a lot of units that can be uh, that can benefit a lot from uh, being a living corpse. Uh, essentially, all it means is that instead of bleeding out at the end of their timer, they just come back to life at uh, half health. All right, <clears throat> next is going to be Banish. Effectively, Exorcism, but, uh, you know, you don't have to be an Exorcist of any kind to use it. Uh, very useful, has some pretty darn solid range. Um, then you have Curse. So, Curse is funny. So, you have three different flavors of Curse. Uh, all of them will just inflict Curse uh, in a different area of effect here. So, Curse is one of those unusual status effects that almost nothing gets a hold of in this game. Um, it's, it, used to be, it used to be somewhat more common back in PSP, although the odds of it hitting were so darn low in that case, uh, that realistically you almost never saw it. In this case, uh, actually I think most folks uh, saw Curse uh, during the time that uh, One Vision had it as uh, one of the effects for one of the finishers uh, early on. Um, Anyway, at this point, uh, what Curse does is it reduces uh, maximum health and maximum MP, but on top of that, has the interesting effect of uh, not only blocking crit or sorry, uh, not only uh, blocking counterattacks, but also blocking criticals. Uh, it's a very unusual uh, uh, debuff here, and actually one of the more potentially overpowered ones if you uh, if you know you're running into the, uh, the later game there, uh, like a lot of those later game uh, beast units uh, with their uh, massive stat advantages, which they you know benefit extra from because beast units. It. Um, if they, for example, pick up several crit cards, uh, suddenly those uh, stone circles they're dropping could be terrifying. Um, well, I guess stone breath too. Stone circle just works better. Anyway, so uh, they could be they could be uh, you know absolutely terrifying, or you could just go hit them with your necromancer, and suddenly what do you know? Problem solved. Uh, they are no longer an issue because they can't crit anymore. Anyway, very uh, very good ability. If you if you've been sleeping on a curse, don't sleep on curse. You can't sleep while cursed. Uh, anyway, um, let's go ahead and mention one thing here. Uh, actually, before we uh, continue on with the skills. Um, as always, apologize for the ums and ahs. Still trying to get get out of that COVID brain fog. It sucks. Anyway, uh, so 
whenever you recruit necromancers, more often than not, they'll have unusually high mind scores. Now, most of their casting equipment will obviously boost all of their stats, in particular intelligence, so usually that'll end up winning as far as the stat war goes, but if you recruit necromancers out in the field, which personally I would recommend always recruiting necromancers out in the field rather than going and trying to make your own, just because of those unusually high bonuses that they're uh, getting for, you know, intelligence and mind and all that, because again, when you're recruiting them, they just kind of assume that since level one they've been that class, so they're, they're, they've already put their whole career into being that thing. Uh, but this effectively means that uh, due to uh, having those big bumps, more often than not, the, for most situations, they're actually able to get away with uh, using a lot of the uh, debuff spells without actually needing to go use concentration. Now, if you want to basically guarantee them, yeah, absolutely go for concentration. But just so you know, uh, you don't actually uh, need it on them as much as many other casters because they're focused less on damage and more so on those debuffs, despite the fact that, you know, their intelligence is still winning here. So, just kind of interesting, unique property of the class there. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and continue on here. Uh, go back uh, over those necromancies real quick here. Uh, so next we've got Life Force. Uh, they're one of only a few classes that are able to use it, namely only, t well, these two for generics, and then I believe there's a couple other ones that, uh, that are unique so they can use it. But realistically speaking, it's these two uh, that have uh, access to Life Force. One of the best spells in the game. Essentially, this means that you are firing out a basic missile attack and more or less uh, refueling yourself for several rounds after. So, Life Force uh, will, you know, benefit from many other uh, from many other bonuses. But unlike something like uh, your uh, your Drain Mind, uh, it's going and hitting the uh, the health bar, which is going to have way bigger numbers, and that's the number that's converted to MP. So, if you already picked up a crit card, magic up card, anything like that, you can potentially see yourself uh, getting you know 200, 400, 500, whatever, uh, depending on how much it crits, uh, uh, MP back. So, effectively, this is a move that allows you to both attack and refill your entire MP bar. Easily one of the top spells in the game. Alright, uh, next we got Putrefy. This is going to heal undead as well as uh, damage any living units. Situationally useful. It's like one of those why not, might as well kind of spells. Um, and then Styx Shift, which I feel is a little bit slept on. I, so, wait a minute. Do I not have the bird spell? Oh, that's such an absolute fail on my part. Okay, apparently I forgot to save when I got the bird spell. Dang it. Anyway. Okay, so there's two movement spells that Necromancers get access to. Uh, there's Stick Shift, uh, which is going to have the single highest range in the game, uh, at a standard range of 8, which can engulf up to 11, and then staff up to 16 range. Uh, this allows you to move uh, incapacitated units uh, pretty much anywhere in the field, right? Um, I say anywhere because, like, 16 tiles is just a crazy long range. It's out of camera range in some cases. Anyway, so... Essentially, what this does is just it picks up that unit and moves them. Now, the interesting thing is the AI will not target uh, units that are downed. So, for example, if you have an undead unit and you want to have a barricade over there, there's nothing stopping you from just, like, plucking up your, uh, you know, your uh, your undead, uh, let's say, dragon or whatever else with Rampart Aura and Steadfast and go shove them over on that cliff over there, and now you've created an immovable wall that will eventually start breaching defenses as soon as it's back up, you know? So, fan fantastic spell that does not get enough use, frankly. Um, so, as far as uh, if you're only using your Necromancers for automatic undead stuff, they've got a lot of stuff for manual inputs, too. And then, the last spell that I don't have here, because I'm apparently a complete dumbass today, um, is going to be uh, Black Plume. Uh, so that's the uh, the one that uh, Nybeth uses, uh, that just allows you to have a replenishable shift stone. Uh, it allows you to turn into a flappy birdie and fly away! Uh, most of these are drops in Palace of the Dead, for obvious reasons. Um, but yeah, Stick Shift, or not Stick Shift, but uh, Black Plume is one of those ones that you kind of just put on there because it's funny. Like, realistically, there's no practical use to use it. Um, if your Necromancer's in trouble, they're probably already dead or have a way to come back. They probably don't necessarily need to retreat because they don't get anything... Like, well, I guess they don't really need experience, so... You know, if they're in a lot of trouble, then I guess it's a way for them to escape. It's just kind of oddly specific, but I love that it's there. Anyway, let's go ahead and talk about their skills. So they get access to daggers, uh, uh, hammers, and cudgels. Uh, as per usual, for the most part, they will come in with cudgels already trained, um, but uh, hammers and daggers may suit them a decent bit better. Um, in their case, unlike some of the other casters, due to their already high mind score, I would probably say it's fine just kind of leaving them with cudgels. Um, 
it really doesn't uh, doesn't really make a huge difference in their case. They hopefully will not ever be getting close anyway. Uh, defensively, daggers with their ability to uh, stop on hit could probably be the more useful one. Uh, hammers, they're so physically frail, especially if you're hiring them out in the field there. The, even in ideal scenarios, you're not going to see a crazy impressive turnaround from using something like this, uh, as compared with just going for their debuffs. So more, more often than not, I would just say either go for daggers if you're looking for those defensive plays, namely, again, the parry and the stop effect you get from those, uh, or just leave them as cudgels just to, you know, have it there. Um, in many cases, I would actually recommend just switching out their weapon skill entirely for concentration, because again, we don't really want them to be using those. They would improve the damage of stuff like your Meteor Strikes and your Life Forces, but again, their debuffs are just going to be a lot scarier. Okay, so uh, let's go ahead and talk about the rest of their skills then. So Master Undead allows you to get Skeletons and Ghosts, neat. Uh, Animate Dead allows them to uh, use a 50 MP on an action move to go raise a unit up from the dead. Well, the undead, rather. Uh, so this will get them back up at full health. This is a very strong ability, nice solid 7 range uh, on this one. Um, and again, it gets them back at full health, so this means that you can just bring them up and have them continue on about their day. Um, so this is especially useful on uh, on any of your beast units. Like I personally love running uh, uh, heavy beast units as far as the necromancer is concerned, uh, just because of how much uh, health you get out of it. Like if you're let's say bringing back something like a zombie gremlin, like that's a that's a small health bar, you know, or just you know a standard skeleton fighter or something. That's okay, but then you look at these guys and they're you know they've got their two thousand health here. That's gonna be pretty noticeable, you know. In their case, if we go ahead and even uh, switch out the uh, the dash uh, for, let's say, something like Constitution, you know, that's 2,700 health. That is a lot of health to suddenly have back on the field. So these are these guys are a great way to shift momentum, um, and I'd say Animate Dead is probably one of the biggest momentum shifters uh, uh, that there that there is action move wise. Um, uh, especially if there's no, uh, well, it's it's both a safety move if there are exorcism units, and it's a great offensive tool to suddenly get all of your meat back uh, if uh, you know if you are having a bit of a harder time. I should mention, by the way, before this seems like the most overpowered combination in the world, there's more stuff than you'd think that have that has exorcism. Like I remember, a lot of us were thinking after looking over Palace of the Dead for the first time, like, oh, there's like two clerics in there that have exorcism. Man, this seems pretty darn good. And then you forget things like uh, uh, like the units that will use the higher-end uh, Define spells, uh, or, for example, the many, many pumpkins that are down there with Crystal Pumpkin, because those will essentially missile the ever-loving bejesus out of your undead units. Uh, we had a few casualties to that uh, when we were doing the AI run, you know, months ago. Um, I do still need to go back and finish that at some point. I don't mean to leave all these things half-finished. Anyway, so... Anyway, Animate, un uh, Animate Dead is a beautiful ability. Uh, Consecrate Dead is a nice little kind of stopgap move here if you uh, can't exactly dedicate a full move to a Banish. Uh, this allows you to uh, prevent an undead unit uh, from getting back up. Now, it is ranged off of yourself, though, which is not ideal, but this basically means if an undead unit goes down right nearby you, and you know that they're not going to get brought back by another necromancer or something. It just gives you uh, gives you additional time to go bring them back up. Um, this can be useful for a lot of uh, very undead heavy maps. Just remember that it's there. And then you have Condemn. It's funny that this exists. So this is hilariously one of the most... I say the one of. This is probably the most useless skill in the entire game. So prohibits resurrection via magic or items remains in effect across the battlefield until uh, unless uh, negated. Now... The thing is, the AI can't revive. So this means that the, the player should never ever use this. This is primarily just here so that generic necromancers can use it against you. Um, but yeah, never ever put this in a skill slot. Because you will never have a single solitary use of it in any case, in any fight, in any particular second of this game whatsoever. Um, I've gone and I've been testing it a lot of different ways to see if it has any other effects that might do something. Like, it, Undead will still revive, it's just living they can't revive, and on the AI side, they just die. So, this skill has zero use whatsoever, it has <clears throat> it has not had that since PSP. Um, and simply put, again, this is more of a system thing that it's, uh, that it's actually here, because if it was prohibited for you, it would be prohibited from the AI, and then the AI would have to use a different version of the Necromancer, and we've already seen how using different versions of the same thing with the same name resulted in the Night Commander weapons suddenly having all their stuff swapped. So, anyway, complicated game, 
system stuff has to happen sometimes. Anyway, uh, aside from that, they have the standard meditate, engulf, and concentration, which is all well and dandy. So let's go ahead and throw them into a quick fight here uh, while we go ahead and talk about a few more uh, use cases for them and whatnot. Uh, yeah, you're fine, whatever. Let's go ahead and throw them in there. So, if you're looking for an AI-centric unit, uh, and you're looking to have them support uh, their undead and stuff like that, like, if you're looking for an undead team, always have Necromancers in there. They won't be able to use a lot of their debuffs, obviously, but because of the fact that they're more than likely already going for beast units, not only does this allow you to get those beast units up with a ton of extra health, effectively giving you a massive HP advantage uh, whenever going and uh, setting up those auto teams, um, but additionally, it allows for a... Um, it essentially allows you to uh, still use debuffs with that wizard, just kind of indirectly. Since again, remember, most of these uh, monster units will have uh, uh, will have debuffs that are still being uh, are still uh, useful here. So AI casters don't uh, don't do debuffs. For those that missed it, it you know it is a thing here. Um, as far as I can tell, this is not a bug and more of an intentional keep the game moving kind of situation. Um, because in their case, uh, essentially the uh, the wizards back in PSP, especially the dang necromancers and such, uh, used to cast them non-stop, which created a situation where if you decided to use them as AI, or if you ran into them as the AI, in many cases, if you found a way to resist those debuffs, they effectively just became useless. So, anyway, uh, so far as I can tell, they just wanted them to still actually have a sort of a threat component to them this time around, so there we are. Um, in fact, actually, in PSP, one of the funniest things was that uh, whenever you ran into a Necromancer, it was uh, less often, oh no, that thing's going to kill me, and more, oh no, I'm going to accidentally shoot them off that cliff, and then I won't get their loot. So, <clears throat> anyway, let us continue on here. So, as far as uh, synergies with undead units, like, there doesn't even have to be anything in particular. I would just recommend a wide variety of different undead units. Uh, typically get two or three Necromancers, and, uh, yeah, you just kind of let them loose and uh, let them do their thing. Um, the one thing that they can run into uh, is going to be uh, units that can exercise. Now, interestingly enough, uh, exorcism can actually be dodged, uh, if you didn't know. So, it does have a fail chance, and you can actually test uh, what that fail chance will be uh, by using a uh, uh, using a holy water on them, uh, because it's actually the same effect. Now, system-wise, there may be a slight difference, but as far as the exorcism effect, it does seem to be that same way. So, if you want to go and uh, stack up their evasion and mind and stuff like that, uh, that stuff will still apply while they're downed. So, if you wanted to, let's say, min-max your units to make sure that they can't get exercised, that might be one way to do it. I'm not saying that's what you should do, um, or that it's necessarily that practical, but if you're deciding what ring to give them, a ring of the mind is almost always the best thing to uh, go give a lot of your heavier units. Um, Simply put, because a lot of their skills, uh, a lot of the secondaries uh, can be uh, uh, can be applied uh, uh, using mind there. Uh, anyway, so good synergies there. Um, as far as your uh, your walking units, again, same thing. You can stack uh, different equipment for that same effect, but realistically, in most cases, um, your necromancers should be able to get them back up on their feet before anything too serious happens. Uh, their, uh, their undead abilities have surprisingly long range, and typically, whenever you're setting up a team like this, it'll eventually just grind stuff down. Something for your consideration if you just want to be an absolute insidious bastard. Fire dragons and hydras. Well, actually, no. Fire dragons, cyclopes, and hydras. So you already saw why on the cyclops. It's going to paralyze things. If you end up getting a Hydra, that's going to be poisoning things, and if you get a Fire Dragon, that's going to be weakening things, which basically creates a situation where, like, they're just essentially choking everything out over time. So it's a very, very, very uh, particularly handy uh, team to have there. Um, in this particular case, I'm actually uh, just running uh, Lightning Dragons for their False Strike instead, just because it was the first thing that I saw on the party list. So there's that. Now, if you're running, uh, if you want to team them up with Longbows, uh, Acid Dragons with... Um, uh, with some archers in the back row with uh, with support from necromancers are also a pretty solid combination, allowing them to sort of uh, single out targets that get breached, uh, another AI setup that'll do the job just fine. Um, additionally, actually, if you want to spread, allow spread around a lot of damage and maybe even get more tricky with it, um, if you can actually make use of uh, 
uh, make use of charm using this particular machine as well. It's like, let's say you have the necromancers, you got your uh, lightning dragons, you got your breach dragons. Those breach dragons drop their breach, you give your archers some cupid bows, those cupid bows uh, will aim for the targets with breach defense, those end up getting charmed, and once they're charmed, the AI knows not to attack them again. So this effectively allows you to spread charm throughout the entire team, uh, you know, essentially uh, singling out targets with those dragons, uh, and essentially uh, having the team go from unit to unit to unit, uh, breaking everybody down. And so charm is effectively a way to control your AI in a way that, uh, that allows you to sort of spread damage throughout the entire team. Again, it depends on what you're looking for in particular, but if that's what you were looking for, Again, you can use Charm to that effect, and while it isn't making use of their really high mind score uh, in the AI sense, uh, that's it's still a potential tool in your arsenal. So, just something for your consideration there. And um, and yeah, so that's the Necromancer in a nutshell. They uh, they help support dead things. Um, so they're basically the uh, the compost pile of the Tactics Overworld, I suppose. Um, so yeah, very solid units. Again, they will have solid, uh, solid, just kind of general purpose damage. Not anything, you know, crazy intense. A lot of times they get this reputation for being in cra like crazy high power units or whatever else. And it's mostly just due to the fact that you're getting tier upgrades uh, up to your uh, tier threes around this point uh, that uh, that usually end up being put on these units. And comparatively speaking, they seem high for chapter four. Uh, but past that point, they're kind of just like barely above wizards as far as standard damage goes. Um, and even then, like the main difference from the lowest to highest in that particular case doesn't matter stats-wise as much as it does uh, uh, kind of skills-wise there. Um, so yeah, either way, count all of that as you will. Personally, like I would say that they are the debuff guy. Like they are the kings of uh, debuffs out of the box. Um, having some of the like, compared, okay. It's hard to compare because they're very, very equivalent to something like a Lich, as far as that goes. Um, but at the same time, it feels like they have kind of a, a better setup to uh, to kind of dedicate to that, you know? Um, like in their particular case, they're already doing the undead support thing, so they're already providing damage and uh, damage and defense and everything else, which means that they probably can focus more on breaking stuff down if you're playing manually, or you, you know they've got their standard long-range basic you know rocks falling out of the sky and what have you, um, if you want to use them on AI. But they'll provide a good value one way or the other. Anyway. So, that's about that uh, for today. I hope you all have yourselves a good one. And actually, last note that I want to leave you on. Sorry, um, I meant to uh, to get to this over the course of this fight. I just realized that's why we're here in the first place. Um, you can, uh, when I say recruit them out in the field, necromancers are one of the more common units that you can get uh, in the uh, uh, kind of peripheries of the game, as it were. Uh, being somebody that uh, you can find uh, wandering around in all of the elemental temples, I think it's all of them. It's if it's not all of them, it's at least most of them. Um, as well as in several areas of Palace of the Dead. I believe Floor 13 might be the earliest. Um, but yeah, generic, uh, just recruiting generic uh, necromancers is going to be generally pretty easy. Um, so again, all of the elemental temples, they can be gotten in Chapter 4. You don't have to recruit Cressida to actually unlock the class. The only thing that unlocking the, uh, the class does for you, uh, if we're talking... Um... Oh, this is the wrong temple. Ah, thank you, brain. Uh, anyway... Okay, so we're not going to see a necrom. Actually, wait. There might be a necromancer on this one. Uh, is there one? No, I screwed that up. Okay, whatever. It's n anywhere but the fire temple, apparently. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, so yeah, the only thing that you recruit uh, Cressida for is uh, to get, like, in a system sense anyway, aside from having a unique character, uh, and to get her ending is to uh, is to get access to the necromancer for denim so that he can go and merge it into the lord. Just kind of add it to the collective class hive mind that he's got going on. Um, all right, so that's kind of about that. Y'all have yourselves a good one. Thank you for stopping by, and I will see you later. Bye.